Hello again, everyone. I'm Dr. George Simon, and welcome to another edition of the new Character Matters program, the program where we talk about what I consider to be the defining issue of our time, the character crisis that we've faced for several decades now, and that has negatively impacted every single aspect of our lives and also to talk about what we can do to turn things around, what we must do to turn things around. Because we have a lot of misguided ideas about what can help us out. We tend to place our faith in more rules and structure. And while I'm not an anarchist in any sense of the word, and I do believe that we need rules and structures, I'm here to assert to you with pretty good evidence that people of wholesome, healthy character don't do good things and refrain from bad things because there are rules and consequences. They do it out of the goodness of their heart, which is where all transformation has to take place. And I'm also here to tell you that people of disturbed or severely disordered character are not phased by the rules or the consequences. They do as they please, even in the face of negative consequences, with a sense of entitlement and with a certain degree of callousness. And today I want to talk about an important factor that plays a role in everyone's character development. And I want to be particularly careful about talking about this subject because there's a lot of misconceptions about what I'm going to be talking about today, which is denial. The topic is denial. It's a word that has unfortunately come to mean many different things and is often misused. And today I'm going to be talking about three major types of denial, three manifestations of it, all of which have a profound effect on our overall character, the way we relate to others, the way we perceive the world around us, and the way that we tend to deal with things. So let's talk a little bit about this phenomenon that I'm sure you've heard of before this phenomenon called denial. In a classical sense, pioneers like Sigmund Freud and others saw what we call denial and what they called denial as an unconscious process, something the mind does to prevent really painful realities from entering into our consciousness. It's nature's way of protecting us against realities too great to bear. It's a temporary mechanism, usually, this type of denial. And I give an example in my books, In Sheep's Clothing, Character Disturbance, The Judas Syndrome, and How Did We End Up Here? I give an example in all four books of this type of denial. I tell a story of an elderly couple, married almost 50 years, deeply in love with one another still, out working in the yard one day, when the man suddenly feels faint, his knees buckle, he falls to the ground. Sometime later, at the emergency room in the hospital, an attending nurse says that he's had a stroke. A short while later, when the lab results come back and the results of other tests, the woman is told that the stroke is severe and then even later learns that it caused massive damage and her husband of almost 50 years is brain dead. He's gone. Still on life support, the woman stays with him by his bedside, holding his hand and talking to him. She comes every day to visit. Every day they tell her the same thing. 
he's not going to make it. He's already gone. But she comes anyway, day after day, for a couple of weeks, holding his hand and talking to him. Now I make this point in all my training workshops. This woman is not consciously or deliberately trying to fool herself. The denial she's experiencing is an unconscious process designed to protect her from unbearable pain. It was a sudden event. And yes, it was an elderly couple, but the whole thing took her by surprise. One minute they were out in the garden enjoying the day with one another, and moments later people were telling her that he was gone. It's too much. It's too overwhelming. And nature protects her by putting up a barrier to her full appreciation of what has transpired. But as time goes on, and as she's able to bear the reality, that denial will break down and the grief that it was meant to forestall will be ever present. She will reckon with the pain of loss. Now that kind of denial is very real and it's adaptive. Nature gave it to us for a very good reason. But there are other manifestations of denial. Manifestations of denial that are very different in character from this kind of denial and have a direct and negative result on people's character formation. There's denial, the tactic, where I deny either doing or saying or committing some action that everybody else knows that I did. This form of denial is simply lying. Mostly it's lying to others to preserve an image or for other nefarious purpose. But you can lie so often and so egregiously that you can begin to believe your own lies. That's still not the same as the denial that's meant to protect you against unbearable pain and that nature equips us with unconsciously when horrendous things happen and that we're not prepared yet to deal with. So when caught, some people deny. And when it seems like their lie is not being bought or accepted, they deny with even greater fervor. This introduces the gaslighting effect, makes the accusers wonder if in fact they have it right. It's a tactic. I call it a responsibility avoidance tactic. And it's significantly detrimental to character formation. Making a habit of this is how people fail to grow in moral character. They fail to develop a sound conscience. And then there is a denial that's kind of somewhere in between the two denials that I've been talking about. And it's rooted in a kind of obstinacy. And in what one researcher called mental filtering. And that is where I refuse to accept the reality because it contradicts my own personal narrative. So somebody tries to tell me something or make a point and I kind of know underneath it all that there's some truth to it. But if I accept that truth, it might invite me to change my stance on things or my views on things, and I don't want to compromise. We see this all the time in, in our ridiculous political debates. 
It's one of the reasons the divisions among us have grown so deep and so wide. Why we're at each other's throats. This kind of mental filtering type of denial where we just simply don't want to see and don't want to hear what would cause us to maybe modify our narrative or to modify our mindset. We have our ways, we have our attitudes, we have our beliefs. And it's not like we would be particularly reneging on an important principle if we took a wider view. But sometimes folks just don't want to see or hear what would cause them to have to work on further character development, opening up their mind, expanding their horizons, opening up their hearts, expanding their capacities. All of these things are essential for good character, but they're hard to do. It's precisely because they're hard to do that we tend to want to avoid them. We are creatures of economy. So it's kind of a sad thing that we have three very different faces of denial and a very sad thing, I think, actually, that we apply the same label to three very different behaviors. In our deeply divided cultural climate, all three aspects of denial are causing us huge problems these days. We have those nefarious characters out there who simply lie, who deny, 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 even when caught, and with such intensity that it makes others doubt sometimes. And that's what the tactic is all about. And we have those folks who simply don't want to be bothered with taking into consideration anything that might cause them to question their perspective or modify their stance or find room in their heart for greater understanding. So this fairly conscious and obstinate refusal to see what you don't want to see is another form of denial that's creating big cultural problems these days and impairing character growth. I've mentioned many times that culture and character are inextricably bound to one another. And in a permissive, morally relativistic, and entitled culture, character disturbances are going to continue to increase in both type and severity until things get bad enough to force us to our senses once again and make us reclaim the importance of character. And that's my work, my life's work, and will continue to be. I will keep sounding the alarm. I will keep carrying the same message. Nothing matters more. Nothing else can rescue us from the, di from the dilemmas that we've been in. No law, no rule, nor structure, nor punishment, nor incentive can take the place of a well-formed character. And we have forgotten the basics of how to cultivate it, how to incentivize character growth. What principles have to be embraced for us to emerge in this life as decent people who know the intimate details of how to get better along with one another and encourage one another, not harm each other, but take care of each other. And toward those ends, I've written all of my books, but most especially my most recent book, Essentials for the Journey. Embracing and Living the Ten Commandments of Character, Proven Principles 
for a psychologically healthy and spiritually rich life. Spiritual health and psychological health and emotional health, mental health, they all go together. You can't have one without the other. And I'll have more to say about obstacles to character growth in the next episode of the new Character Matters program. So until then, I thank you for tuning in. I invite you to visit my blog at drgeorgesimon.com. Avail yourself of the numerous free articles on the blog and to avail yourself of my books, all readily available on Amazon. And to tune in again next time for another edition of the new Character Matters. And until then, I'm Dr. George Simon. Take care.